always love that huge studio audience. Woo. Welcome, welcome to Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller, joined by my amazing co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and uh, amazing producer, Brian Atkins. We have an amazing guest for you today, Ryan Dusick. Ryan is the founding drummer of Maroon 5, a marriage and family therapist, a podcast host, a coach, a speaker, and the author of the beautiful, triumphant book, Harder to Breathe, a memoir of making Maroon 5, losing it all, and finding recovery. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you so much for joining our show. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for having me on. Well, there is so much to mine. As I said right before we started, your book was so moving and courageous and beautiful. And I'm just, I'm I'm eager to dig into a lot of the details and so you say in the book, we were living the dream and I was at the depths of despair at the very same time. And so to give our reader, our, our uh, listeners and viewers a little context, you and Adam Levine, Jesse Carmichael, uh, Mickey Madden, and eventually James Valentine had worked ceaselessly in building Maroon 5 for what was Kara's Flowers into Maroon 5, you worked insanely hard for over a decade, and you ended up winning the Grammy for Best New Artist. I thought that was hilarious. You'd been doing it for 11 years, and there you were, Best New Artist. You achieved more than your wildest dreams, and then it all fell apart. And you went on what can only be described as the the most, uh, what felt like in reading your book, insane, um, terrible hero's journey. So I want to start from the beginning and fill in some key details. So you were 13 when you met Adam and Jesse, correct? You guys were in the same middle school, right? Is that right? In in Brentwood? Very close to to, to spot on. I'll, I'll give you a, an A minus. <laughs> oh, God. Was, God. Uh... I'm trying hard. I'm... Well, and we're going to talk about perfectionism. So good way to just get me triggered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually knew Adam when we were little kids. Um, I'm a, c- a couple years older than him. I'm a couple grades older than him. Uh, it's really only a year and a half difference in age. Uh, but when I was 10 or 12 and he was a couple grades below me, he was just like this annoying little brother. Uh, <laughs> you know, he was, we had mutual family friends and we t- even took a family trip together once down to, uh, I think La Jolla from here in LA. And, um, and so I'd known him, but we weren't really close friends or anything like that until later when I was in high school and I was part of the school band and he and Jesse and Mickey were middle schoolers. And when the older guys in my band went off to college and I was left looking and scrambling to find people to, to play with, I remember that Adam, you know, played uh, a little bit of rhythm guitar and um, and and so I he was somebody that popped up in my mind, but I didn't know he could sing. Um, so I was about 15, 16 at that point, and he was 14. And then I heard him sing for the first time. And that's when things kind of changed. And we, we became much closer at that point. We became very good friends because we were really bonded by our love of music. Well, you you talk so beautifully about him and honestly and openly. We'll we'll get into that, too, from annoying, uh, kind of annoying little brother with acne and ADD. And I love the story you tell about going into the 7-Eleven. And oh, my God, this is so funny to think of Adam Levine like my own kid. My own son does the same thing. When you're getting the big gulp, you get all the different flavors. <laughs> And, you know, it's like Mountain Dew and and Dr. Pepper. And and you you kind of shut him down. You were like, yeah, that's that's not cool. (laughs) And he dumped it out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I forgot to mention that part of the story. Yeah, that was sort of in between when I was about 13 and he was probably 11, something like that. Uh, I had just started playing the drums and um, and he and our mutual friend, Adam Salzman, came over to my house and we were trying to start a band. We did start a band. We just play, only played like three rehearsals because the bass player never showed up. And uh, and then we went over to the local 7-Eleven and he did that thing where he's like, check this out. I learned this thing. You put the seven up and the Coke and the Pepsi and Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and I, and I, I turned to him and I said, I used to do that when I was young and immature. 
<laughs> and he got real dejected, poured it out. And <laughs> I don't really remember that specifically, but he tells that story to this day. And so I presume that is true, or at least his version of it is true. <laughs> yeah, well, we all know that memory is memory is slippery. You know, about 50 percent of our memories are accurate. But it's just it's a sweet story and it's a funny way to think of Adam. And it was so beautiful to in your in you know from him writing the forward to your book to you're just talking about the you know the 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 brotherhood with kind of the the love and and challenges and all those things but just even going back so they begged you to be in their band which i thought was hilarious it was right mickey adam and jesse they you were the older cool guy who had already been playing in clubs and so forth in la like it was interesting to read about how you were 15 and I think it was like playing the troubadour. I mean, I'm, I live in Colorado, so I don't even know about these places, but I feel like I've been there now. And so you guys, it sounds like very kind of, you heard his beautiful voice. You guys had enough talent. You taught yourself drums. And then, and then what happened? I mean, so like the four of you started to gel and then what happened? Yeah, so it was. Uh, this is 1994. You have to set the context of uh, we were big fans of grunge rock. It was Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and of course Nirvana, which kind of set the stage for all that big shift in what was going on in music. And we were bonded very deeply by our love of this music. I mean, Adam, Jesse, Mickey, and I. Every Friday when school ended, we'd all jump in the back of my Jeep Wagoneer, hand me down jeep wagon your white, white jeep whale. wagon here and drive across town yeah the white whale it was this big dilapidated hand-me-down car that was falling apart at the seams and had a bunch of stickers of all of our favorite bands on the back of it and we'd all pile in there and drive across town uh, in la traffic and spend the whole weekend just listening to music playing music uh, we were very inexperienced. I mean, I had played in my older brother's band. And so, yeah, I had played on the Sunset Strip at the Whiskey A Go Go and the Troubadour uh, and the Roxy Theater. And I'd played with the school band for a few years at that point. So I was the most experienced. Um, but Adam was sort of the most naturally talented. I, I refer to him as sort of a, a savant. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say an idiot savant because he's he's a smart guy. But <laughs> let's not call Adam Levine an idiot, except for maybe when he's no. being super annoying. <laughs> you no, know, he's uh, he's he's a smart guy. He just uh, you know, I think that it was he just stumbled onto this talent. It just kind of flowed out of him, and it wasn't that he had studied music really. It was just that he had a natural knack for melody and harmony. But Jesse was this very inspired different personality adam and i there was a weird triangle of personalities between me adam and jesse because adam and i are like opposites um in a lot of ways similar in some ways probably more than i'd like to admit but <laughs> but we're opposites in a lot of ways because adam is he he was uh, an add kid so he kind of hyperactive and impulsive and hard to get him to focus for very long but also very, you know, creative and and just able to kind of go wherever his ideas led him. Um, and then for me, I was by nature more uptight, for very per perfectionistic, kind of a Type A control freak. Uh, not very, you know, akin to just kind of going with the flow and letting things roll. Um, so we were complementary as much as that could. You could see that as like that's not going to work because those are opposites that aren't going to be complementary. We actually did complement each other, I think, in that uh, he needed some of my organizational skills, some focus and ability to kind of hone in on what we're trying to achieve and, and see the task through. Uh, and I think I needed some of what he had to offer, which was, well, certainly talent, but also uh, just the ability to kind of um, follow your impulse and go where the inspiration is uh, and get out of that, comfort zone a little bit just go with the flow so we were complimentary and then jesse was this interesting third uh point of the triangle very idealistic very um sort of grandiose in his ideas more more prone to wanting to take things a step further or try something that uh neither of us had thought of or that was you know on another level he was already putting like a, a 32 piece orchestra on our arrangements when we were still playing <laughs> in a garage, right? <laughs> so Ryan, I my oldest son played in a high school band, he's in college now, and I remember 
They had so many interpersonal conflicts. And I thought, this is really equipping this child for marriage because it's the it's this amazing practice of negotiating and having this goal and these problems to solve that they have to overcome and being kind to each other even when you're angry. And like, it's funny, I'm thinking about you as a marriage and family therapist now. Do you feel like people who have those experiences have maybe more skills for relationships? Like, did you come out of that with more relational skills in a way? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have related being in a band to being married to three or four people. That's kind of what it's like. And all the ways that could be wonderful and all the ways that is very challenging. I think that I was probably well prepared to handle that situation, though, because I did grow up in a very loving, supportive family. And I think that the way that we communicated was healthy. Uh, you know, there were some issues in our family that came out later in my life in terms of my understanding of myself um, and some of my parents' background and their traumas. Uh, but we definitely did have good communication styles and it was a healthy, supportive environment. And then in high school, I also was involved with the school newspaper. I ended up being the editor in chief of the high school newspaper. And so for three years, I was on the editorial board and eventually ended up running the editorial board as the editor in chief. Uh, so I had a little bit of uh, experience in just diplomacy and how you navigate different personalities and bring people together. Um, it is a little bit like group therapy at times, and it is like a and family. There's, there's something about, like, did you guys feel like we want to be famous? Because there's something so intense about these young egos being like, but we could be famous and I'm going to be the front man. Like, did you guys have to negotiate that? Yeah, and that's what's kind of amazing to me about the fact that we did have chemistry and were able to to work things out collectively because it was the original four members were all big personalities with big egos. I think all control freaks in our own ways, different way, different sort of uh, manners of going about it. But um, but you know, Adam definitely he was you know opinionated, but reluctant at first actually to be the front man he was shy he was a teenager he had a lot of acne at that time uh, and although he was a very outgoing very charming kid already uh just having the spotlight him and on him and carrying that responsibility of of being the the front man was not something that he was at first comfortable with but everyone had strong opinions i mean mickey was very can be stubborn very opinionated very cool taste a hipster at his core and so, you know, had very a very clear vision of what uh, the band should be, even like in terms of image, what we should dress like, what we should look like. And Jesse had these, you know, sort of grandiose visions of where it was going to go. And then I was a control freak. So, you know, it's kind of a lot of uh, perfectionism and, and type A sort of energy in four different guys in a room together. Somehow the chemistry worked, not just musically, but I think there was that complementary aspect of the different ways we went about it. My dad used to refer to us as a sort of a four-headed monster. <laughs> it's like somehow all, all of these brains work together to create this this great uh, fire. It sounds very family family like. Yeah, you yeah you you really. I mean, you're so. I feel like in your book you talk so um, lovingly about about that brotherhood and and while there were tensions and so forth, and you guys would disagree, especially when you were on the road for like three years in a row that you would um, you would always resolve your disagreements and there'd be disagreements in the studio and so forth. But ultimately, you know, there was just a profound amount of care and loyalty. And even when things got bad, it was it was really heartening um, to hear about how you all treated each other. Um, but let's let's rewind again, just because I want to kind of give the, the context here. So you guys were in high school and you all put you set your sights really high early on you guys agreed you want to be rock stars right I mean big bull like talk about the egos of these young men and you got your first record deal when you were 17 is that right you guys were all in high school and had this huge freaking record deal with Warner right yeah I had just finished high school I'm being a couple grades ahead I was I had started at UCLA uh and I was in my, I guess my freshman year at UCLA, they were still uh, juniors in high school, the other three. And we got, our, well, actually, right when I was graduating high school, we got our first independent record deal. We made a record that never came out. That ended up 
being the thing that got assigned to a major record label, Warner Brothers. Um, and my second year at UCLA, their senior year in high school, we were in the studio recording a million dollar record, basically. Wow. With Rob, Rob Cavallo, who was, you know, the, he had just had massive success with Green Day, their first two albums. And he was he was the the producer of the moment. He ended up winning the Grammy for producer of the year that year. He worked with Alanis Morissette and Goo Goo Dolls and Weezer and just like one hit after another. And we were these little chits, <laughs> these little spoiled brats who uh, somehow had gotten this record deal in high school and were in the studio being spoiled by this incredible grandeur of of talent and and money being you know spent on us i mean they were throwing money at us but they were spending a lot of money on our behalf we made this record in a great studio made a, a video we went on the road right right when they finished high school um and so it was a lot really fast but uh you know the, all of the the things they told us of us going off and becoming rock stars you know we just took it at face value because we did not just have the ego, but we also had a, a lot of naivete. We just sort of assumed, oh yeah, that's what happens. You get a record deal, you you know make a great record, you go on the road, and then your stars didn't really work out that way. Well, and yeah, I just I love how I mean you guys had a lot of hutzpah from your I think you in the early days as a young teenager were playing in clubs, and it was just cool to hear that you op I mean you if anything it feels like. Yes, you know, we think of of Adam, you know, as the kind of the front man. But my reading of the book is like you really opened those doors by going out, and it was Kara's flowers at the point at that point, which is a hilarious story. We'll maybe we'll get back to that. But the um, this, you know, you as a young man going in and booking shows and getting attention, like you freaking hustle, dude. Like that was cool. Like you you hustled. I, you know, in fact, I just had breakfast with this young woman, you know, like little like, you know, upcoming soccer star. And I said to her, like, you create your own luck. And I think of what you you and your bandmates did. You guys created a lot of luck. But how did you end up um, meeting the Cavallos? Uh, the Cavallos, let me remember, uh, I, we were close to signing with a different record label, Atlantic at the time, I think. Uh, there was a guy named Tim Summer who you could give a lot of credit there were a lot of different people at different times that discovered us, you know, right. he was one uh. of them. Um, well, we had, we had been signed to this independent uh, record label, these two incredible guys, Tommy Allen and John DiNicola. They were shopping us around to the majors. We almost signed with Tim Summer. And then right around that time, it was when we started looking for a manager and we got, because we were getting attention from major labels, um, Bob Cavallo, Rob's father, um, who had managed everyone from uh, Prince to Alanis Morissette and Seal and going back to like the Loving Spoonful and Earth, Wind and Fire. He was a big time manager. And none of that meant anything to us because they had Weezer on their on their management. Right, right. And that, that was what mattered to us. We were, you know, 17 years old in the mid 90s. And it was Weezer and Green Day. That, those were the bands that were... Um, relevant really relevant so um bob was like yeah well well if you come work with us we'll um we'll get you signed with with robbie over at reprise warner and uh and he'll produce your record and and so the other guys had no chance at that point it was like that was just everything to us to be with the guy who produced green day uh and so we went full steam ahead with the the cabalos at the home and you talked about you talk about how in i mean it reminds me a lot of venture capital is, you know, even with record producing, it's a sink or swim situation, right? And what does that mean? Yeah, I, you know, I haven't been in the record industry for a while now, so I can't compare it completely to what, what it's like now. I know it is a different world, but in the 90s, it was still this, the the corporate kind of, from the 70s through the 90s, this sort of sink or swim thing where they would sign 10 artists a year. Each record label was signed 10 artists a year. They'd spend a million dollars on each of them, which sounds insane. Uh, but and but you know, one out of the ten would have a massive success, and that's where they would make all their money. But what would happen to the other nine? Of course, you end up they would just drop them. They would sink. Were... <laughs> well, the other the exactly. one winner is swimming. Uh, the others are are sinking, and that I mean, so 
you know, we we think, you know, of of Maroon 5 again almost like overnight success, but you guys went through you you had this huge record deal and then and then what happened? Yeah, like I said, we thought, you know, it's a done deal. We go out on the road for a, six months or a year. We're going to have a hit song on the radio and we're going to have a platinum record and then we're off to the races. Um, the first single came out and made a little bit of buzz the first week and then dropped off and didn't really take off from there. Uh, we stayed on the road for about six months, opening up for bands that were probably not the right. Uh, it wasn't the right context for us stylistically, really a lot of punk ska kind of bands, um, which was fun. We had a lot of fun on those tours, but it, it didn't really seem to make an impact in terms of record sales. Um, so next thing we know, um, we're trying to call the people at Reprise Warner and half of them don't even work there anymore because there's, every five years, there's a monumental shift in the record right. industry Consolidation and, and so forth. Right. Yeah. So we came home with our tails between our legs so that the record hadn't taken off and we go back to Warner Brothers and we don't recognize anyone there. All they know is that we had a record that came out and didn't sell. And so we, we actually had another record on our contract that we're committed to make another album. But we, the writing was on the wall. It's like, they're not going to make this a priority. They're not going to spend any money on developing and promoting us. So it was essentially, we want to buy you out of your contract, which was nice in that we ended up with a little bit of cash uh, just to keep us afloat for a little while. Um, but we really had to start over other than that completely because we now had no, we went from major record label to no record label, major management company to no management. Uh, even our attorney and our our business manager, everyone walked away, and we were just like back in the garage. It was just me. I literally took over as manager again, just booking us gigs around town and doing the mailing list. That was it. Well, it's amazing that you you know you had that to fall back on. What did that do to the band? How did you guys treat each other, and did you blame each other, or how did you how did you go from there to then? You know, obviously there's a, some good news, but what was that bridge like between that failure and then the next phase? It was a rough transition for sure. That was definitely the moment that a breakup seemed most imminent. Um, and I wouldn't say that we blamed each other. I think there was a lot that went unsaid and there was just resentment that was probably a little misplaced. I think we were all just disappointed and frustrated and it hadn't worked out the way we had wanted to. And I know Adam in particular, because he had made this so important for himself, which I can relate to a lot. Um, you know, he wasn't really an academic like I was. He was somebody that the arts was really his place and, and had allowed himself to invest himself in this in a way that I don't think he had anything really before uh, actually, basketball was the other thing that he loved a lot growing up. He was really good at basketball. But um, but the band was everything. And he was, at that point, he and Jesse were the, the main songwriters. I had been writing a lot earlier on, but then Adam and Jesse kind of formed this Lennon-McCartney-esque Lennon McCartney sort of um, chemistry as songwriters together. And so he was more and more becoming, although not a leader in a managerial sense, becoming the focal point, not to the point where he became later, but... I, I think more and more it was like this was his baby. And so I, I saw that he was really frustrated because he he just wanted to move on completely. He's like, I don't want to play any of those songs anymore. I want to start over completely with a different style. He was listening to very different music and wanting to change what we were doing pretty drastically. And I was frustrated by that. I thought, well, we started something just because it didn't take off doesn't mean that it's, there's not still that potential. Let's keep moving forward. We have a, a fan base in L.A. We can sell out these clubs on the Sunset Strip. Let's not alienate them. Let's build from that. And so there was a little bit of a rift developing. And the stylistically, we were all over the place. Adam and Jesse took a break and went to New York uh, to a, a music school on Long Island called Five Towns College. Just for a semester, uh, I re-enrolled at UCLA and Mickey was at UCLA as well at that time. Uh, so Mickey and I were kind of bonding and, and with our in our frustration with Adam and Jesse and then feeling like they were pulling away from us. And I'm sure that they were considering, do we really want to be, you know, associated with this thing that had been hopeful and then really didn't take off? And they were contemplating their own reality at that point and where they were going to go. 
And oddly enough, when they came back to LA, there was a renewed sense of connection because independent of each other, we both had been listening to the same kind of music and inspired by a lot of the same stuff. That was a total departure from the music we had been playing before. So Ryan, before. what was so it? What, yeah. who, it was, oh, so you're saying when Adam came back, uh, then you guys had kind of coincidentally been listening. And what what were you guys feeling and both kind of coincidentally inspired by? Um, so Adam and Jesse were living in five in, in uh, Farmingdale or someplace in on Long Island where this school they went to. I guess uh, I, w- I never went there, but I guess it was a, a largely um, African American student body. I think, or the neighborhood was. I don't remember if it was both. Um, and so they were listening to a lot more um, hip hop and R and B and um, music that you know we'd all heard and and enjoyed, but they had they you know hadn't been in, immersed in it in that way. Um, I had gotten really into classic soul and R and B, like Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye, um, and then I was starting also to listen to some con- contemporary R and B and hip hop. I was listening to at the time like Destiny's Child. Uh, of course, Beyonce came out of that. Uh, I was listening to stuff like um, Busta Rhymes and um, other stuff produced by Timbaland and the Neptunes, uh, Jay-Z, and that kind of production style was influencing my rhythms and drumming. And then we were all listening to Lauren Hill. Her record was really big at the time. Um, and so they were listening to some of the stuff that I was listening to, and we were all turning each other on to this stuff, and we came back together and there was this this renaissance that happened both in the inspiration of this music that we were listening to uh both the classic uh soul and r&b and the contemporary hip-hop and r&b um and then also just kind of a renaissance in our friendship because i was back at ucla i'd kind of been making a lot of friends for the first time in my life and i thought you know adam was one of my best friends there was this rift but i wanted to share that with him i wanted him to be a part of it. I was like, you, you would love these guys. These are your guys. We were playing midnight basketball. Some of the early, the early two founders of Lincoln park became a couple of your buddies. That was in that time in between when, uh, there was that little bit of a breakup. Um, yeah. Um, Dave and, uh, and Brad, the guitar player and, and bass player of, of eventually later of Lincoln park were guys who lived, um, in the dorms with me in my freshman year we spent a lot of time together. And I think that if I had pursued it, I probably could have been the drummer in Lincoln Park as well. Uh, Cause they put that band together during that time. Um, and they were looking for guys to, to, you know, kind of put together uh, a band to showcase the material they were writing. They didn't have a drummer at that time. So uh, they, they asked me to kind of play with them and, and do some showcases and stuff. And um uh, we were in the middle of making the Cars Flowers record, I think. Oh no, yeah, that was a little earlier on. That was my first year at, at UCLA. Um, but yeah, that was that was interesting. That was a, a nice little departure from the band because the band was, you know, my whole world for a while there. And to be able to have other musicians to connect with and play with, that was that was fun. Well, okay, so then, so uh, Jesse and Adam go away. They come back. It's a renaissance. And did you guys immediately say, okay, let's go and try to get another? record uh you know label to pick you up or or how did you proceed after that you know kind of that that disappointment and everybody kind of going and you know doing that little like introspection and then now you're you're all back in LA and then what happens I took it upon myself to kind of take the reins again which I think in some ways the other guys probably appreciated because I was a go-getter and had that um that type of mentality uh however i'm sure it kind of i i I get the sense that it probably annoyed them a little bit too just because adam and jesse in particular saw themselves as more and more as the leaders of the band um and here here i was you know taking it upon myself to sort of be the manager um but it but it was helpful i think in terms of getting us to that place again and I was just at UCLA. I knew there was a built in audience there, you know, uh, even though there weren't a lot of venues in Westwood where uh, a band could perform. There was one that every Thursday night, it's where all the sorority girls went to party. It was it was the the night out on Thursday night. Uh, So 
they hadn't booked a full band. They they had, you know, singer songwriters with the acoustic guitars and comedians and stuff like that. It was a small room. Um, and I walked in to, to management of that establishment. And I said, look, if you pay us whatever it was, $200 a week, something like that, uh, and uh, and allow us to play, you have the night, Thursday night. I know that's their big night, but let, let us have Thursday night from, you know, 10 to 2 or 9 to – we'll play two sets and I promise you, within a month, we'll have a line around the block. Wow! And uh, it was a bold statement. And, and within four weeks, we had—they were turning people away at the door. They were lined up down the street, and it was like the place to be in Westwood on a Thursday night. And we became kind of the UCLA band for a while there. And um, right around that time as well, I mean, I was booking us around town, all over the place, on the Sunset Strip, down in Orange County. Um, and so we, it didn't take very long for some of the record industry types to start showing up at our shows again. And there were a couple managers in particular that took interest. One was um, Cheryl Crow's manager. That was his claim to fame. And so we were really intrigued with that. He was a seemed like an important guy. But then uh, this guy, Jordan Feldstein, Jordy, as we called him, um, who was an old friend of ours, uh, he was... A, uh, Adam's, uh, dads, their, their dads were like close friends since college. And, um, and Jordy, he grew up with Jordy. He's Jordy was my age. Uh, I played soccer with Jordy when I was a little kid. My dad was a coach. Um, and Jordy was like a junior agent in one of the, the agencies. Well, I, and, I love how uh, you talk about Jordy's hutzpah. Tell talk about how he showed up with phones for you guys on the first, uh, first meeting. Yeah, well, Jordy was competing with this big time manager. I think he knew that, that he was trying to sign us as the first artist that he was going to represent as a manager. He wanted to go his own way, separate from whatever agency he was at. And and here was this big time manager courting us. And he saw the writing on the wall. It's like, I got to make a big statement to try to pull these guys away from that. So this was like around 2000, 2001. Um, when people were had cell phones, but you know, not every kid our age necessarily had a cell phone in their pocket, and certainly not a nice one. Uh, and we were performing at the Westwood Brewing Company every Thursday. And he comes to sound check. He shows up, and he's got four boxes of brand new Motorola cell phones. Hands one to each of us and says, "I need to be in contact with you twenty four seven because I, I need it. to talk to you." <laughs> That's so, smart. I mean, that, listen, that's that that gives you your edge. I, I'm like, oh, I like this guy. Like, so like, how can you say no to that? That's so cool. Yeah, we all looked at each other and we we're like, OK, this guy is a baller. He knows what he's doing. I'm listening to all this and I keep being struck by and I can't stop fast forwarding to the fact that you did have to leave this band. And it hits me in the heart as I hear it, because we're the same age, but my son was, is this age now that you were then and how connected you were. And I, I can't stop thinking about that. It just, well, hey, let's, but I want to rewind. I want to make sure we're, we're going on the journey because yeah. we okay. are going to get there. And, it, and it's, it's just like, just oof. as a warning, yeah, it's like, a, a pre yeah. Okay. Prepare to have your heart broken. Oh, yeah. um, but there is, there is redemption in the end. So this is the good news. So you, okay. So you, so Jordy got behind you guys. And then at some point, uh, was it Quincy Jones checked you out and that helped facilitate your next record deal? Is that right? So close again. Again, an A minus. <laughs> oh, A minus. Don't give me an A minus, Ryan. Come on, I'm working hard here. <laughs> I got to give you some incentive to keep trying, right? It's just a little bit. Now, it, we, uh, it was actually um, our good friend from high school, uh, Will Nash, his, you know, he was Graham Nash's son who was the facilitator of getting us in the studio with a producer again, working with Jordy, the two of them were able to pull this together and get us into a really great studio. And um, Graham funded it and, and hired his old buddy, a great session drummer, uh, Russ Kunkel, who was a, a drummer. He played on Crosby, Stills and Nash records. He played on um, Joni Mitchell records and Jackson Brown and James Taylor even one of our heroes at the time, Bill Withers, uh, he played, I think, on Lovely Day and some of his other hits, which to us, that was like, okay, we're in. 
And so we got in the studio. Jordy was able to somehow on this shoestring budget get us into Conway Studios, which is where we had done the basic tracking on the Cars Flowers record. And we get in with Russ Kunkel and, and Graham Nash is facilitating all this. And it was like just one of those moments when the planets sort of align. We had just the right material right at the moment that we had this great team behind us and a great studio. And we were just, we were literally writing that week, three or four songs that ended up being the core of the songs that became songs about Jane. And we went in the studio and just immersed ourselves in this process. You were right about the Quincy Jones element in that uh, Rashida Jones, whom people know now as, uh, you know, great actress, uh, been in a lot of stuff. Um, and producer and director, and she's done a lot of great work. Um, she, you know, she's Quincy Jones's daughter, and she was a friend of the band as well. Um, she came to some of those sessions and actually ended up singing some harmonies and background vocals on those demos, and did actually on the record as well. Um, and I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. She was a beautiful young lady, but had a great voice and just a great presence. And Adam, as you know, has a high voice and kind of a very beautiful angelic male voice and she has this sort of husky sultry female voice and the the combination of those two voices i i liken to fleetwood mac with stevie nicks uh and lindsey buckingham he has that kind of higher register male voice and she has that husky darker female voice it was that to me and i wanted her voice to be really loud in the mix and like more of a duet but eventually the, the record label felt that was a little confusing because she wasn't not yeah not not maybe kind of giving you guys the spotlight as much and at that point james valentine had joined you and and you would become you would no longer care as flowers and now you were maroon five James was actually at that session at the at Conway Studios. We called it the Conway Five, five songs we recorded there. He was at the session changing guitar strings and being the guitar tech. He wasn't in the band yet. Uh, he was just a, a, a hick from Nebraska that had just gotten off the boat and, uh, and was hanging out in Hollywood, just making friends with other musicians and had uh, been introduced to us through a mutual friend and was just spending a lot of time at what we called the Lowry House, which is where Adam lived with uh, Will Nash and a couple other friends. Um, and he, he just sort of, in a wonderful way, sort of ingratiated himself into our circle of friends. We knew he was an incredible guitar player, and we were intrigued by him and his band. Uh, but uh, we needed someone to, to, to tend to our instruments because no one in the band was very good at that. So he was actually the tech for that session. But then he started jamming with us, um, and there, there was a, the writing was kind of on the wall there where we realized there was something special about James and he brought another element, especially because at that time, Adam, who had been a guitarist and singer and Jesse, who had been a guitarist and background vocalist, um, Jesse was now playing keyboard a lot of the time. Adam was wanting to become more of a front man and take the mic off the stand and not play the guitar all the time so whereas we had two guitars we now had like half a guitar and so um weirdly enough james just kind of fit in as that element and he was also james was a trained jazz guitarist like he was the we were a, a garage band and we were self-taught mm -hmm. uh for right, the most right. part jesse was starting to study um classical piano and stuff like that but James kind of James came in and he kind of classed up the joint. You know, right away it was like, there, here's a real musician in the room, a guy who actually knows what he's doing, and so it kind of lifted us up immediately to another level. And okay, so then, and I I recall there was a little bit of you know uh, just um, time required to get him in because he was in another band. But then, um, and, and so. Eventually, I feel like you and Adam kind of triangulated and said, you've got to be in this band, right? And he was like, like, okay, right? Like, twist my arm kind of thing. And now, uh, how did you guys become Maroon 5? How did that name um, come to pass? Well, we had tried for years to change the name. Uh, it was an ongoing discussion and battle because Horace Flowers was in some ways sort of an albatross around our necks. Um we had named the band 
after a friend of ours, Cara, that we had delivered flowers to on her birthday. That was the night that we started. In the middle the of the night, I might add, that. sneaking out of the house three times. <laughs> Great story. Yeah, we snuck out of my parents' house and back in because we didn't. We realized we didn't know where she lived and we had to get the school directory to get her address. And then we had to go back and get a Thomas guide at the time. We didn't have cell phones in those days. So uh, we, that was the story. So the name Cara's Flowers had a meaning to it, but the problem with it was that um, her name was Cara. If you see the name written down, everyone pronounced it Cara, Cara's Flowers. And we hated that because that wasn't her name. Um, and then at the same time, every time we would say the name Cara's Flowers on stage, no one understood it. They thought we said Carson Flowers or Cars and Flowers or something like that. So it was just it wasn't working. It wasn't a memorable name. And then also we had made this record with Warner Brothers under the name Cars Flowers, which had been a commercial failure. So in the industry, it was an albatross. It, it was weighing us down because people associated us with that past that we didn't want to be associated with. And then on top of that, we had this whole new style and sound that was different from that band. So we wanted to distance ourselves, but changing the name just trying to find a name that everyone could agree on was hard enough. But then every time we would find something, it was always taken. It was now we're in the era where you could Google or not Google, whatever the search engine was at the time, look up. And then you could find 10 people who were using the name that you wanted to use. And maybe if somebody had trademarked it or whatever. So it took forever for us to find a name. And it wasn't until we signed our second record deal, um, with Octone Records and they agreed that we should change the name and, and said, we have to do this before we put the record out. It's got to be a fresh start. Um, and then the whole time we were recording songs about Jane, it was like every day people were bringing in names. We would get in big arguments about it as we did about everything. Uh, we'd finally think we found one and then we'd find out that somebody already was using it. Um, and so it was, it was, it was a labor of love to name the band. Originally it was just Maroon. And I actually have a poster from one, the one show that we played at the Viper room under the name Maroon without the five at the end, but then it turned out Maroon and Maroons were taken. So we added the five when James ah, joined. Interesting. A, a and let me add, I mean, just a little kind of technical question. Maroon has two meanings. How did you interpret it? I mean, it's a color and it's a verb. Right. It, yeah. It, well, you know, I, I will probably get my head chopped off if I get too deep into the meaning of, of the. We, That's we okay. Swore an oath That's okay. Certain you point. got a strong neck. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of meanings to the word maroon, and I like the fact that there's some mystery to it. You know, because there there's been some a lot of different interpretations of it. Certainly, the 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 verb to maroon. Uh, some something or someone to be marooned on an island. Uh, there's a reference to um, there was a, a, a band of escaped slaves from the Caribbean called the Maroons, um, and uh, and then also that one you know Pearl Jam was our first favorite band, and everyone knows that. Um, and so there's a line in the song Jeremy on their first album in pools of maroon below. So a lot of people have made reference to that, assuming that might be the where the name of the band came from. Um, I won't tell you exactly, but I will say we like the fact that all of those things are all uh, those things are uh, maybe contribute and add to the mysticism. OK, so then you've got James, you're Maroon 5 and and now you you know, and meanwhile, you're building buzz in L.A. and uh, famous people are showing up right to to watch you guys at the stage, even, you know, even in this fairly early stage. And then. Uh, songs about Jane hits and I think you guys started you were really pushing harder to breathe and you went out on tour right for like a, a long time right am I getting this right in terms of kind of the sequence be and I, I, I don't want to go too fast here because this is when you guys exploded right 2003 well it was an overnight success that took a decade to get there uh, and even even when we got there it it was two years of incessant touring before the the album really took off. So 2002 was the year that the album came out, but we were already on the road for six months before the album even came out. This was, this was a total about face in terms of strategy for marketing and, and building the brand that became Maroon 5, which we were up for and happy that it was going to, it was going to be that way, even though it was it required a lot of hard work and long days, weeks and months of, of touring 
because you know I had described that that the previous incarnation of the the record industry where it was the the sink or swim um you know you you think you're going to make it and then it's over this was octone had a vision we're going to put you on the road you're going to be out there for at least a year we're going to do a slow burn with the first single and really try to build it up one radio station at a time uh we're going to get you some tours opening up for other artists that are going to be good audiences for you and it's going to take you at least a year to make a name for yourself and then an, at least another year if, it, if that happens uh to take it to as high as it can go it ended up being double that in totality because in 2002 and 2003 alone we played over 500 shows in those two years and that's not even including like the um the the radio station appearances the in-store appearances the the meet and greets the fan club shows it was just driving ourselves around in a in a van um just playing day after day it was exhilarating and exciting but uh exhausting and then we finally, part of the breathe was like a year from the summer of 2002 till the fall of 2003 before we had a moderate hit um, and the record had gone gold, I think, by the time we did our first headlining tour in the fall of 2003. Uh, but it wasn't until the second single, This Love, in the start of 2004 that things blew up to the platinum global level. We had, I, I have to tell you, we at this time I was working at a very popular, very celebrity busy store on Robertson in Los Angeles, which was a major shopping street, major full of paparazzi. It was the place to be seen at the time. And there were about eight of us. We were all in our 20s working in this shop and people would come in to see what was happening, to see what was the next big thing. And one of the husbands of one of the gals worked in promotions and he would bring us these early CDs. We'd put them in our little six disc changer, you know, for the store. And one of them was was songs about Jane. And I remember one of the gals who was very high up at Sony, I believe, or Columbia at the time was one of my clients. We were shopping. And um, I think the song is She Will Be Loved. Um, that song comes on and she stops and she looks around and all eight of these 20 something gals are all singing it and then half the customers and she goes what is this and I was like I don't know Rachel's husband gives us these CDs and she was like every girl in this store is singing it and she's like this is going to be huge like when you get that and, and I never forgot that because I looked around and she was right everybody was singing and everyone was all the girls were just feeling their deep feelings and it was like a, almost a cultural moment when that album started taking off well and i just love you talk about there you have some funny stories about john mayer and, and he said something similar to you guys when and i just i love how generous he was in in uh, allowing you to open a bunch of his shows and introducing you and some shticks and funny stuff, but I, I love the reinforcement that he gave you guys. And I can't remember what song it was, but he heard it and said, this is my favorite song and you guys are going to be huge, which, you know, shout out to you, John Mayer, for bringing that that superstar, you know, swagger to this young group of, of you know, aspiring musicians. It's so cool. Yeah, John was a great champion for us early on, right at that pivotal moment. I think it was at the end of 2002 when we were working harder to breathe still and um and we opened for him like three or four shows on the east coast uh it was our, those were our first arena shows opening for john uh and yeah the first show we played was at temple university in philadelphia and he waited he very graciously waited for the crowd to fill in because when we the time we were supposed to go on the place was only like a quarter full so we waited for it to he held the the curtain you know for us the opener, which nobody ever does that. I mean, that was incredible. And then he walked out and, and introduced us. And he he had just told us, he heard us playing This Love and Soundcheck. And he's like, that's my favorite new song. And he said that, he said to the audience, he said, this is my favorite new band of 2002. And it's going to be your favorite band of 2003. This Love is my favorite song. It's going to be your favorite song next year when it comes out. Uh, it was a year, over a year later that This Love was a single. But literally that night, there was a shift. I could... Just feel the energy in that room. What you're describing in terms of this reaction that these young women were having, 
we had been touring around in our van and, you know, every now and then we'd see people start to come to the shows and start to sing along to the songs and that kind of thing. But this was the first time that we had, you know, 10,000, 12,000 people in a room that in a matter of a half an hour, they went from not knowing who we were to literally screaming so loud that it was deafening. And it was like, you could, you just, there's, there's something going on here. There's something that's going to, it's going to go, this is going to go. And we walked off stage and my dad was at the side of the stage with a camcorder and Adam comes running up to it and he goes, we're going to be fucking stars. <laughs> oh my God. You could totally see that. Yeah. And you, and, and I mean, self-fulfilling prophecy with a uh, real quick on, I thought you told a, a really hilarious John Mayer story, you know, shtick and all aside. Uh, talk about when um, he was hitting on, by the way, I love Shan. I know I don't know her, but <laughs> your uh, longtime uh, partner, talk about like how he would kind of hit on her and then how he, um, how he kind of uh, came clean. Yeah, John's a funny guy. I haven't talked to him in, in a long time, so I don't know how he feels about me telling these stories, but it's pretty interesting. Well, it's in your um, book. So... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, certainly. I, I anything that's in the book is fair game, and I, I you know, it's, it's stuff that I, I laugh at. You know, it's, it's just such funny, funny stuff to reminisce about. Um, so yeah, it was the same time. It was when we first opened for him during that time. Um, my family was out there. It was Thanksgiving time, and so my parents had come out. I have family in the D.C. area, so they were there. My dad had driven down from D.C. Uh, to Philadelphia for that show. Um, and then my girlfriend, Sean, was flying out uh, from L.A. the next day to meet me as well in D.C. Um, and so we had had one day, one show with John, and we had already gotten a little glimpse of his personality. And we didn't know that much about him. You know, in, in my mind, he was this odd combination of a blues guitar hero and a pop singer songwriter that the, all the ladies were swooning for. This very sensitive, romantic seeming guy, your body is a wonderland, and you know, those early songs. And then and then this shredding blues guitar guy. You didn't really see those things go together necessarily, but but uh so I was trying to figure out in my mind who this guy was, and then we met him and within twenty minutes we realized he's he's like a big goofball. He was just doing his stand up com comedy routine for us. And for twenty, thirty minutes before we went on stage, he was just entertaining all of us, telling stories and and doing his shtick. Um, and, but some of it was a little off color. He was talking about his girlfriend at the time. And, uh, and I, I was like, this is a little bit inappropriate for having just met you in this context. Um, so then fast forward to the next show, um, and Sean came to the venue and showed up right when we were on stage doing sound checks. So she was backstage with her pass watching from the side as we were sound checking or going to our dressing room or whatever. And I come off stage and she's waiting for me. I'm happy to see her. And uh, she's like, so I met John. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. What was that like? And she's like, he's a, he's an interesting he's an interesting guy. And, and I was like, okay, what what does that mean? And, and she's like, he was very friendly. Very friendly. He came right up to me and he was talking to me. And, and he just talked to me for like 20, 30 minutes. I didn't, couldn't get a word in edgewise. He was just talking and talking and talking. I was like, well, that sounds like my first impression of it too. I was like, was he hitting on you? And she's like, well, I don't want to be so bold as to say he was hitting on me, but he was certainly flirtatious. But yeah, he was hitting on me. I was like, <laughs> you're, if you're a woman, you know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, you know, I think she obviously didn't want to make me feel jealous, but I was like, okay, it sounds like he was hitting on you. I'm not going to hold it against him because he probably didn't know she was with me. She was, who's this cute I think girl backstage? Flattering. I, yeah, I mean, what right. the heck? It's flattering. Well, the end of that first part of the story, because there's several stories in the book about him and this, it, it recurs. But the end of that story was that we then went into the catering room uh, to eat some dinner before the show. And and Sean and I are sitting like on other sides of like a uh, cafe style table eating. And he walks into the cafeteria, comes straight over to our table and pulls up a chair at the end of this table, like right in between us. And then like, orients his chair facing Sean and is just begins talking to her as if I'm not there <laughs> and is just clearly flirting with her right in front of me and we're like kicking each other under the table and just I thought it was hilarious and then and then he starts going into the same shtick 
that he had been doing for us the night before. I guess he hadn't done it for her yet. And and and, so, and I had already told her about this. I had said, you're not going to believe this first impression. We have this story that he's telling us about his girlfriend and the women and relationships and all this stuff. And now he's doing it like a, a repeat performance. Like it's the shit. For her. And so we it's just. It's the John Mayer shtick, yeah. which, is, which is hilarious. Yeah. I've never thought of him as that kind of goofball. Right. I thought that was very kind of refreshing and surprising. Yeah, it was it was funny. I mean, I got to to realize that he he just he saw himself as a comedian. And, and whenever there was any kind of crowd of people around him, he would just start riffing. <laughs> well, I, I thought it was so cool how uh, you guys did openings for his shows a number of times and how um, I think did he even maybe play with you guys a time or two? It just it sounded like incredibly generous for somebody of his stature and success and, you know, reputation and so forth um, to take you guys under your wings. I thought under his wing, rather, I thought that was just, it, it really gave me a lot of respect for him. Yeah. At the end of that run, that first run we did with him, he came out on stage uh, and played this love with us uh, at one of his shows in Connecticut. Uh, and that was another moment where it was like, we had never heard, screamed like that you know it's just like wow this is this must be what it's like to be a star and that was fun for us i mean john is just i mean incredible musician uh i i have played with some good musicians and there's only a handful that i would put on a on the level of just going like okay this is a whole other whole other stratosphere okay and playing with him it was almost like it made playing our own song easier because his rhythm was so good mm, <laughs> and so tight wow. and the way that he was playing that I just like, it was easier for me to kind of sink into a groove playing with his, his feel. Um, so that was exciting. Well, yeah. And then the last little bit that just made me laugh when you and Jesse, I think were together at, at his apartment or some, some place together and Jesse left the room and he said something to you about, just he came clean about uh, hitting on Sean and it was in a way that was so surprising. I don't purport to be an expert on John Mayer. You know, you hear about, you know, kind of these these stories. I just thought it was really cool that this guy that had taken you and the band under his wing, you know, said something to the effect of just how he's like, oh, like, I, you know, that I know it kind of wasn't that cool for me to hit on your girlfriend. And you were so gracious to him. And it just like these little behind the stories, um, when you think, like you say, some of these superstars, when they get humanized, to me, when they show vulnerability, to me, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, that was a nice moment. He was actually kind of, I think, shocked that I was not angry or offended. And he apologized. And, and I was like, I said what you said. I was like, if anything, it's flattering. You know, a big star is, is, is flirting with your, with your girlfriend, like, um, I must be doing something right. <laughs> well, totally. Yeah. And that's what I mean. Ultimately, you know, yeah, it's, it's fun again to kind of, you know, talk about these uh, geez, uh, superstars and rock stars are humans too. But I just, I do love the kind of the, the vulnerability there. Okay. So all the while, I mean, you talk in the book about the physical pain, I mean, the self doubt, the, um, you were talking about coordination issues, exhaustion, sleep problems. You even talk about malnutrition. So we're all like, oh my gosh, these are teenagers into young men that have been grinding for 10 plus years. You have achieved, I mean, you're hanging out with Prince, you're hanging out, like Jimmy Page is ask, asking to meet you and, you know, like like beyond anybody else's comprehension, right? You guys, these young men that are on the, you're on the freaking rocket ship. And yet, all the while, you're talking about your experiences going in and out of, of, I mean, imposter syndrome, OCD, perfectionism. So will you talk a little bit about what it was like as you guys were riding the rocket ship up and what you did to keep yourself together and, you know, just giving a little bit of color and maybe a little foreshadowing to, you know, what ended up happening? Yeah, it was, you know, it wasn't something that happened overnight or in one show or one tour. There was a a gradual evolution of touring being something that I was very excited and committed to in a really positive way, uh, to being something that was becoming really difficult and painful, uh, and eventually something that was breaking me down. 
And it was something that happened over time. The first sort of inklings I had that there was something wrong um, w- was probably on our first headlining tour. Uh, when we went, we'd been touring for a year and a half and it was exhausting, but it was fun and exhilarating. And we were playing opening sets, which were like half hour sets. Um, the hours were long, the drives were long. It wasn't, you know, there were times when we didn't have a lot of sleep and I certainly was exhausted, but I, I felt like I was able to keep up with the pace of it. But then we went to headlining and we're playing like 90 minute sets every night, um, the, the, if anything, the demands on our time were, were becoming greater because now we had interviews and photo shoots and more, you know, we had to fit in video shoots and things like that in between promos. And and we'd pull into, you know, you'd think coming home to L.A. would be a, a nice respite, but everyone and their mother wanted to see us when we were in town for three days. There was no rest to be had. Um, we, we, you know, we, we I think at the start of that tour, to start our headlining tour, We did three sold out nights at the House of Blues in Hollywood. And each of those days, one day we did the Ellen DeGeneres show. One day we were live on the air on Kiss FM. One, you know, it was like, it wasn't, there was no rest. There was no stopping. And that just continued from that point on. And we, and after that, we started going overseas. We went to London and did like a week there, just promoting the album coming out overseas in in Europe. And then we went to Asia and we, so it was like, what had been unrelenting now was even more intense and on a bigger scale. And, and with jet for lag. Me, yeah, add jet lag to that. And I was somebody who had a problem with sleep to begin with. Jet lag made, made it even worse. And for me, it was also a combination of a, a few different factors because we were all going through this, obviously. Everyone was in the same boat. But for me, I was a self-taught drummer. I had never learned proper mechanics to a certain degree in terms of what can minimize the strain that you're putting on your body. Um, so I think to a certain extent, I was exerting myself more than probably was necessary had I learned some of that. Um, I was also um, highly perfectionistic and always wanting to be at the very best of what I could achieve. And and feeling that self-doubt because I wasn't a trained musician in that way. And now we were playing with musicians who were and who were on a, a level that I... I was like, okay, what am I doing here compared to these people that that played, that studied at Juilliard and Berklee School of Music? And um, and so there was that imposter syndrome. There was a lot of self doubt. There was I was putting a lot of pressure on myself. On top of being physically exhausted, I'm now bearing down even harder just to get through these long sets, and then and then having to, the next morning to perform on a radio show or on a TV show. And now it's like you got the cameras on and that little red light goes on and the pressure is even greater. And so there were a lot of factors that really sort of created this perfect storm within me that um, it was causing me physical pain. It was causing me um, a, a certain amount of breakdown of my coordination just because I was getting more and more constricted and having to find ways to play through all of that when I was tired and when I was in pain, um, that it became... A snowball effect. I was sort of in this feedback loop that the things that I was doing to get through it were making it worse, and until until it was really affecting me, until it was no, becoming noticeable to the other guys in the band as much as it was to me. Had they? Um, I mean, so you could you could argue, especially based on what you're describing, you didn't maybe learn the uh, formal way. So, uh, so you may have developed some patterns that were even harder on your body as a drummer than somebody who was trained formally. But when it comes to the emotional pressure, I mean, especially for Adam and you even, you give some props to Adam to say, God, you know, at times I don't, I, I, I didn't realize maybe even how much more pressure he was under as the, you know, the face of the band. Um, but did you feel like everybody was also kind of feeling this? It's surreal it's too much it's you know we're or or did you feel a little alone in that kind of that in you know that what you were going through emotionally at the time i felt alone just because it's weird i i consider myself to be a pretty sensitive guy and comfortable with expressing my emotions but i think to a certain extent you know being a young man the vulnerability especially 20 years ago uh, I think, you know, the, the, the standards for, for 
what is normal behavior for uh, a man or a woman in terms of expressing emotion has maybe hopefully evolved a little bit since then. But for me, you know, in, in 20 years ago, just saying to my buddies, hey, guys, I, I'm not doing so well. You know, I, I'm feeling I'm, I'm doubting myself. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling depressed. Like, that's just not something I would have done. And I think it was probably just a cultural sort of stigma um, and wanting to just kind of bear down and be tough and, and tough it out and get through it. So I, the fact that I wasn't reaching out and I wasn't sharing and, and getting that support from my peers um, did make me feel kind of alone or did, I'm sure that they would have been supportive. I'm sure they would have tried to understand if they didn't. I, in retrospect, I think I, I do believe that everyone was going through something, uh, the pressure, the, the demands of the lifestyle, maybe in slightly different ways based upon our own different temperaments and personalities. But I know that Adam was feeling the pressure. I know that it was manifesting and like sometimes his voice was breaking down and he was kind of scrambling, trying to figure out how to maintain performing every day the way that we were. Um, and he, to his credit, that's what he started to get a lot more serious about his craft, you know, and, and he, st- we hired a vocal coach who helped him do, you know, warm ups and take care of his, his vocal cords. You know, he cut, kind of, he was never a big drinker or any smoker or anything like that, but he quit that stuff completely because the priority was, uh, I want to be at my best. Uh, and if those things are going to make that not as likely, then I don't want any part of it, which for, you know, a 23 year old kid. Yeah, I got to jump in and flex here a little bit. One of our really good friends is Mike Love, the lead singer of the Beach Boys, and he credits uh, TM, a Transcendental med- uh, Meditation, as uh, as hugely helping him succeed. I mean, he's in his early 80s and they're still doing two to three hundred shows per year, you know, um, like. They just Beach Boys just uh, celebrated their 60 years, you know, as a band. And so that the not drinking, the not smoking, you know, he gives huge credit to his wife, Jackie Love, as well. But I mean, that says a lot about about Adam, you know, that he had that early discipline. Right. And that, you know, you talk in the book about the partying and so forth. So it is interesting to hear that, you know, maybe he kept that rock star persona up but he really did protect his his voice because that you know that's that's the edge. Ryan, did you know at the time that there was an issue with maybe your form or your mechanics that was affecting you or is that something you see looking back? Uh it became apparent to me during that time. Um uh, because I I realized I realized that I was when I was straining and when I was tired and when it got to a certain point of like, okay, we're an hour into the set. We have another half hour and I feel like my arms are going to fall off. Like I'm not doing this as efficiently as I could. And I would watch other drummers. I think the first time I ever really experienced imposter syndrome as a drummer was when I watched uh, Travis Barker, who at the time was in a band called the Aquabats. He later joined Blink-182. This was back in the Cars Flowers touring days. Um, because he was a, a he, his background, when he had been in marching bands and that kind of thing, he'd been a line drummer before he was in bands. So he had that sticking technique where he could play very fast, very powerfully and efficiently. And backstage, he would have a little drum pad strapped to his knee and he was just doing his paradiddles and rudiments, things I had never even heard of. That didn't even occur to me. You know, I picked up the sticks and basically... I had just watched MTV and emulated my heroes that I saw playing the drums just by listening and watching drummers. And I got a lot of positive feedback early on. I was like, I was the star drummer at my high school. We were playing around town in the early years of the band. And for a garage band, uh, especially early on, I was kind of a bit of the focal point because I was a little bit older and more experienced. And I had a lot of flair. I played very much like an athlete. You know, I was very physical and and it was a like lot of Chad Smith style. Absolutely. Chad Smith. I mean, I started playing in the late 80s and it was like the hairband era at that time of like Tommy Lee of Motley Crue and Steven Adler of Guns N' Roses, where they sat really low and had their cymbals really high and they twirled their sticks and played, you know, very uh, flailing around and stuff. And then in the early 90s, yeah, Chad Smith and Dave Grohl and uh, Dave Abrazee of Pearl Jam and Matt Cameron of Soundgard. Those those guys were my heroes. Very hard hitting, very driving, very physical drummers. Except that I didn't have the sticking technique to make that more efficient. 
And now we're playing more groove based pop music, which requires more intricacy and playing like with more feel and more, you know, just sort of subtlety. And I'm just kind of trying to slog through it like a crazy rock drummer. Um, and so watching a guy like, like Travis, who was able to play with that kind of speed and, and ferocity, but he had that sticking technique to make it very efficient and to play very cleanly and tightly. And it looked effortless. And I would sit at the side of the stage and watch him. And I was in awe. I had never seen anything like this up close. And it was like, aha. Well, it's amazing what you achieved by being self-taught, right? And just what you were able to, yeah, I mean, just what you're able to achieve. Okay, so now you guys are like Grammy, I mean, SNL, Saturday Night Live. Uh, you win at the Grammys, Best New Artist. Um I mean, I I can't imagine it getting any headier, right? You're on a world tour and now, but you're, you're feeling increasingly itchy because you're, you're, you're in pain, you're feeling the self-doubt, you're feeling the imposter syndrome and so forth. And now you're, you're, you approach Adam about, um, or maybe he approaches you about making your next album. And so then what happens? So we... Around 2004, when everything really took off, there's two chapters in the book, um, one called The Big Time and the next one called The Small Time. And there was this juxtaposition between everything that was happening on the surface that the public could see, and all the things you just described, playing on SNL and winning Grammy Awards and platinum records and all that. Um, and then there was what was going on for me inside and how I was breaking down, not just physically at this point, but emotionally and psychologically, because the the playing suffered to such an extent that at a certain point I had to stop touring. And I came home and I was living in, in my one bedroom apartment with Sean and was just feeling really disconnected from the band, from everything that was going on. I was still going out on the road for, from, for stretches and I was there for the award ceremonies and all this stuff, trying to stay connected, but feeling that rift more and more and feeling really more and more de dejected you know my psychology my, my self-esteem I there was just a lo level of insecurity that I'd never experienced before just feeling like uh, what am I doing like I don't belong here I don't deserve any of this success but then I was maintaining this this sort of character that I had created to try to keep up with the rock star life that was emerging for the band and so there was this Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing that was happening yeah, to even he to read about how painful it must have been to go and and be on these video shoots and like pantomime dr um, drumming, right? I feel like there were at least a couple of videos that you describe that you were there uh, physically, but it was like you were fake drumming, and I can imagine just how freaking terrible that must have felt. Like you're not even playing; you're pretending. Yeah, that was a really painful moment because I had been home for a while going to every kind of doctor you can go to and doing physical therapy. I wasn't supposed to play the drums uh, because I didn't want to re-aggravate the injuries that I had. At this point, I mean, I had been diagnosed with chronic tendonitis in my right shoulder and something called thoracic outlet syndrome, which was causing nerve slowing down my right arm. Uh, and so in my mind, I was doing all this work to come back to the band feeling the self-doubt, feeling like deep down inside, it, it's not going to end well. Uh, but then still maintaining this delusion that somehow maybe when I get behind the drums again or, or rejoin the band, that everything's going to work out. But then when, you know, they came back in town, I think it was for the video for She Will Be Loved. That was the moment where there was the crossover. We'd had a couple hits, but that was the crossover hit. That was what we called the, mm -hmm. the soccer mom hit. <laughs> mm -hmm. everyone it is and my mother... favorite song, so I guess you're right. I am a soccer mom. <laughs> I meant that in the best possible way. No, that's, I know. That's when you yeah. go from you mm -hmm. know, you go from being a, a niche band to being, you know, just ubiquitous. And mass. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and we'd made the video for that record and I hadn't been playing the drums for a while and all I had to do was just, you know, it's just a music video. You, you basically pantomime, but even just doing that was both painful and felt uncoordinated. I couldn't really keep up with the track. There was the playback coming and I kept getting off the track and it was embarrassing. 
and I, and like the director was like, can you not hear the track? And I was like, I can hear the track. I can hear that I'm not able to play the, to the track. So it was, it, that was a really, and that was when things started to spiral even more. And over that year, when we were going to the Grammys, doing all this stuff, it, there was that juxtaposition between the big time and the small time. And eventually it came to a head where we were in a studio um, in 2005 um, with Matt, the, the drummer who had replaced me on the road, was there as well. And he was filling in for me still. But we were trying to write more material for the next record. We had already written probably half of the material for the next record when I was playing with the band. So we were very excited to make the follow-up. Um, but now it was actually time to, to put up or shut up. And I was trying to play with the band and it just wasn't happening. And so there was this day after day thing where Matt was still filling in for me and we were making demos and I couldn't play on the demos, but I was still holding on to this delusion that somehow this was going to work out, even though I knew deep down inside it wasn't. So then um, the first chapter of the book is this scene and I made it the first chapter because it's this pivotal moment in my life. It's like everything that came before it and everything that came after it. In my mind, it's almost like if you were telling the story of of uh, a murder mystery. It's like the scene of the crime. You start with the, the bloody gory details of what happened and then you try to figure out how the heck did it get to that and how could you possibly go, where could you go from that? You know, they, they call a, a meeting in the in the dining room of this big estate in Laurel Canyon where we were recording demos, the, the Houdini mansion. Um, and, and this is you and your band and the producers and it's like all the people on the ground making this next album is is where you kind of just set just really clarifying the scene so it's all you guys and now like you say it's put up or shut up time well they're all there the, you know there's producers there our manager jordy was there um but jordy said i think you should go in and meet with the band and it wasn't any of those guys it was just the band it was just me and the four other guys walking in and sitting at the dining room table and that's when i knew okay something's going on because if this was a meeting about, you know, scheduling a, a, a photo shoot or whatever other thing we needed to talk about, Jordy would be in there or whoever, our publicist would be in there. It, but it, it was just It almost sounds like it was like an intervention, right? I mean, and, you know, kind of when you think of those kind of terms. <laughs> yeah, I'd had that feeling. It was like, oh, like I can't deny this anymore. You know, all of those delusions, all of that denial just went out the window. It's like, I know what's coming. And Adam sat, you know, at the head of the table, which was the position he had been sort of getting more comfortable with at this point. He'd been doing a lot more interviews and making a lot more choices as the sort of new leader of the band, which the band needed and needed him to be. And But it was this odd moment where, you know, I had been early on in the band, the guy who was the big brother who was in charge and making sure that everyone washed themselves and, and you know, put, tidied up their, their guitar chords. Uh, and now I was just sort of meekly sitting there waiting for Adam, who had become, you know, the, the sort of father figure of the band to deliver this news to me, which was a managerial decision. Essentially, it had become unfeasible for me to continue to try to be a member of the band, that they had to make this record. And the way he put it to me was, look, even if you could get through this record, we're then going to have a world tour book to pr promote it. And what happens when the same thing happens, when you can't play anymore? And he, he phrased it that way. What happens if not if the same thing happens, but what happens when the same thing happens? And so I knew I knew at that moment there was there was no bargaining with this. This was this was a done deal. But that didn't stop me. I still, I begged and I pleaded. I, I was like, maybe I can produce the record. Maybe I could be the band's producer. Maybe I could just be another member who, you know, plays a, a tambourine or, shit, you know, plays the bongos or something. Um, but that was just me sort of desperately clinging. Yeah, I mean, desperately clinging to, to say more because I think we could guess, but I, I don't want to guess what, what you were feeling at that time. It was devastating. I mean, my... My heart kind of sank down into my stomach. It was that moment of everything, just the floor sort of dropping out from beneath me. Like everything that I'd been using to keep me in that, in that place of hopefulness, whatever amount of hope that I had still that maybe this was going to 
turn out differently just fell away immediately. And I, I think that I, I, in that moment, I fell into a depression and I think I found ways to, to pull myself out of it just with a certain amount of um, defense mechanism. I had this alter ego that I could step into. And that's when the drinking started to escalate. And I was going to ask you, because at that point, you you hadn't been using much, you know, in terms of uh, medication. It sounds like maybe some medication to help manage the uh, the nerve pain and and the you know the the brutal uh, kind of uh, force you'd been putting on your body but at that point you you weren't a big partier you weren't a big you know drinker or drug user right well i i was late to the game with all of that i was a good kid i never tried drugs or drank i'm not when i was a teenager i didn't do any of that stuff maybe once or twice but it wasn't like a regular thing at all and then in my 20s i kind of started um drinking casually with friends um, and it was part of a conscious effort to not be so uptight because my nature was to be very, you know, wanting to be my best self all the time. And I kind of was getting feedback, not just from friends, but from my family, even, you know, I think you, you would be served to loosen up a little bit and try to have a little bit of fun. You know, you just, you put so much pressure on yourself and you're, uh, you don't have to be perfect all the time. You could let go a little bit. And so alcohol became a facilitator of that. It, it, and I, it was a relationship that at first was a positive one. You know, I, I think that I I felt like I was more relaxed in social settings. I was more outgoing. I I was not as self-conscious and so mindful of being, um, holding myself to such high standards all the time. Um, and so it served me during that time. And then when we were on the road for the first couple of years, um, it was still that it was kind of a way to facilitate a good time. Uh, but then when I started having the dark times and when I was really feeling the pain, both physically and emotionally and psychologically, uh, that was the first time that drinking became a way to cope, that it became escapism and avoiding feelings that were negative feelings. And that's when it became a totally different relationship and a, and a much darker one. And then you add to that, I was going to all these doctors that were prescribing me pills for this and that, and combining that with the alcohol, that's when things kind of started to go off the rails for me. And in, in particular, when I I wasn't playing anymore, I wasn't in the band anymore, and I was left to my own devices in terms of how to, is that question, like, where does it go from here? Yeah, I want to pause there because it's like, from the time you were 13, 14 years old to now you're in your mid to late 20s, right? And your whole identity was not just in a band. You're, I mean, you were in the band. You started the band. Your best friends were the band. Your UCLA friends were, you know, everybody was kind of connected back to the music and this lifestyle and so I just like I really want to set this, you know, pr uh, no pun intended, like set the stage. So not only from what you describe and, and one can imagine, have you been, um, you know, you were not forced out of the band, but it was the only logical conclusion. And you speak so graciously about how, you know, Jesse, Adam, Mickey, you know, the all of them were to you like they didn't want you out. They wanted you in. But they they couldn't they couldn't have a drummer that couldn't drum. So then so now they go on to their on their lives and, and tours and and new albums and you're you're alone. And then eventually you and Shan, you talk about out of your band of 12 years you're out of your relationship. You know, you're this beautiful, wonderful woman you've been with for five years. That's out. I mean, that sounds like rock bottom to me. You would think that would be rock bottom, but it actually took me another five years after that to hit a uh, real rock bottom mm -hmm. for me. But it was, mm -hmm. it was devastating. And, you know, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head when you said identity. You know, my whole identity mm -hmm. was wrapped up in being in that band. I had this isn't made losing it a job. my entire identity. Let's just, yeah, it's not like you were just fired. Like everything you had worked for. And that's and a all family. the highs and it's a family at that per, yeah. point. Yeah, family so identity, hard. you know, and it's wonderful to hear about how your, you know, your parents were so um, attentive and so forth. But okay, so, so okay, so you've left the band, 
And and now you say it, you know, it's five years. But talk, you know, talk to us about that that journey. I mean, you talk well, and let me just add a little bit, just since I I think the color is important. You talked about being on Xanax and alcohol, and the how you know the benzos are. You know, if you when you combine alcohol and um, uh, drugs like Xanax or Clonopin, how they are central nervous system depressants. So, you know. Talk about that. And then, you know, it, it is it is so it, it's like gutting to read your book and how dark it got. But I do think it's relevant, you know, and especially again, spoiler alert. Here you are brilliant and and healthy. But let like just talk about what happened, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, it was it was a really difficult time that I really didn't feel like I had any way to cope other than to escape. Because not only had I lost my identity and all the things that the band brought, you're absolutely right. It was my family. It was my whole entire social world. Everything that was my spiritual connection to life, you know, purpose, meaning, brotherhood, uh, collaboration, creative collaboration, my artistic and creative uh, expression, it was everything. And so that was all gone. And then on top of that, and you alluded to this, I also had to sit there and see the people that had been that for me still on the biggest stages in the world. And, you know, the next record's coming out and they'd come to town and they're playing the Forum or the Staples Center and they're, uh, you know, on TV promoting their new single and playing on The Tonight Show or SNL. So it was like a constant reminder of what it was that I was missing out on. And so it was just so overwhelming that I didn't really feel like there was any way to deal with that or cope with that loss. And it really was a loss. I I relate to it also as a grieving process that I had to go through. I went through all the stages of grief. You know, I was, I was very depressed, but I was angry. I was bargaining with myself. I was, um, you know, basically I had to come to a place of acceptance to, to, to find closure on that chapter of my life. But I was also mired in this addiction now where I was going through this back and forth, uh, between the, the alcohol and the and the anti anxiety medication, and it was just this roller coaster that I was uh, going up and down, and the downs were getting worse and worse over time until I did finally hit that bottom. I mean, it sounds like profoundly lonely, profoundly guilty, profoundly shame filled, right? I mean, I can't imagine how you didn't just, you know, yes, you said angry, but want to blame yourself, want to blame others. And, you know, and what you describe in the book, it's like the lessons, it's like Robert Downey Jr., less than zero. I mean, when I was reading it, honestly, it, it, it was so, it made me sick to read about how you would black out and just, I mean, what you put yourself through out of so much desperation. And I mean, you you were killing yourself, yeah, I, I I don't think that's an exaggeration. At the end of my drinking, um, I was very sick. I mean, I was physically sick, as well as certainly spiritually sick. Um, I was basically drinking till I'd pass out every night on the couch. Uh, I'd wake up to a flood of anxiety and panic that was uh, there was really no way to get rid of without a chemical solution. I was basically agoraphobic. I couldn't really be around other human beings if I didn't have a certain amount of medication or alcohol in my system. Um, and my skin was turning gray. My eyes were turning gray. My, you know, I was just like, it was, it was bad. And, uh, so, I mean, thankfully though, when you talk about a bottom, you know, a lot of people, it, it, it doesn't really hit them how low they are until they're on the street or did their family have turned their back on them or they're in jail or something really life altering happens that you can't recover from, you know, now you have, um, you know, legal charges and things that are, you talk about guilt and shame, things that you're never going to really get over in terms of things you did to harm people. I'm so grateful that it wasn't that kind of bottom for me, that it was a spiritual bottom. It was just feeling really broken and disconnected from living. And that I was just sick and tired of living that way. And I had thankfully this moment of clarity where I recognized that I had become the maker of my own misery. As unfortunate as that past was, at this point, what was perpetuating it was the fact that I was still doing this to myself and that if I continued to do that, it was going to keep getting worse until I died. And so if if I, if I had any shred of me at that point that still had any hope that life had something to offer, 
other than this reality, then the fact that I was continuing to do that flew in the face of that hope. And that if I wanted that, if I wanted my life to have some meaning and purpose again, that I needed to start walking in the opposite direction of the direction I had been going. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that looked like. It wasn't like I could I could even express it in the way that I'm expressing it to you now. There was just thankfully yeah, that course. gut feeling. I don't want this for my life and I don't want to die. I actually want to live again. And I know that I'm going to have to accept help and start walking in that direction of recovery if I if I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I, I want you to rewind for a moment. And you, you talked about having gone in and out of uh, treatment and, and eventually you went to Betty Ford. But am I hearing you say there was a moment somehow in this, maybe it was an extended moment where you said, I want to live. Is that what happened? I think so. I don't, you know, again, I don't know if I would have been able to express it in that way at the time, but I knew that I, I knew the things had gotten out of my control uh, and I had tried for so long. There's a chapter in the book called the illusion of control, uh, which is a phrase you hear in, in recovery rooms a lot where, you know, just, just all the stages of denial, all the rationalizations you make that somehow I have totally. control over this thing. And, it, and in doing so, somehow I have control over the feelings. I had realized I had no control over the feelings or the the addiction and that I was basically ready to surrender. I just didn't know how to do it yet. I didn't know what that would look like. And it was scary. I mean, change is scary. The idea of admitting I am I am totally powerless over this thing is a really scary prospect. So what there were a series of things that led to the moment where I where I was in acceptance of that. And I give Sean a lot of credit for being a pivotal figure in that. Because there was, there were, you know, our, our relationship had been so complicated up until that point. And there wasn't that sort of codependent um, thing that happens in addictive relationships. And, uh, you know, God bless her. She, she was trying to help, you know, she was trying to help me and she wanted the best for me, but she just didn't know how to do that. And we were stuck in this thing where things were getting worse. And there was one night I was, we had moved out to the Valley where I live now. I, I, we were living in Los Feliz in East Hollywood for a number of years. And then we moved out to the Valley and this house where, Actually, this room that you see now that has this studio, I had been trying to build it, um, but it was I was running into all these roadblocks to build a studio, and I was commuting to this little rehearsal space to try to make music, not very well, but um, and every single day I was telling myself, okay, I'm not going to drink today. I'm going to go over to the studio and have a productive day, and then I'd end up drinking, and I end up coming home, and Sean be like, you drank again, and this one day, and this went on for a long freaking time. I mean, this wasn't like, yeah, this went like on for a two years. week bender. Like this went on a long freaking time where you would drink till you black out, where you, you describe going out and you have an intention to do something else. And you end up back at a liquor store buying more vodka and then hiding the vodka. Like it, it it's like what, you know, like kind of the, the worst of it, it seemed like. Yeah, the, at the very end is when it became what you're describing, where it, that illusion of control was lifted because that kind of that uh, that kind of control was gone for the longest time. I thought I had control because I could stop for a period, or I could like limit it to just beer and wine, and that's the rationalization, right? It's like, well, I didn't I didn't drink for all of February, so therefore I don't have a problem, or I was I took a week off, so uh, I have control over this. But at the, at the end there, the last maybe six months of my drinking, it was like I couldn't go anywhere without some alcohol stash somewhere. Um, and if I wasn't drinking, it had to be the pills. And this one day, I was like, okay, I'm going to white knuckle it. I'm going to go be productive. And Sean said, what time are you going to be back? I said, what, what time do you want me back? She's like, well, I'm planning on making dinner at 7 o'clock. So if you could be back for dinner at 7 o'clock. I go into the studio. Next thing I know, I wake up from – this desk actually that I'm at that was in that studio at the time. And uh, I'm, I am clearly had been passed out like with my hand on my, on my uh, chin. And I look up at the computer and I see the time and it's like nine or 10 o'clock at night. I had been in that position for three, four hours, whatever it was. And, uh, and I looked down on my phone and I see all these missed calls and missed text messages all from Sean. So I'm freaking out immediately. I'm like jolted awake. I feel like I'm sober. Uh, it'd been a few hours, but, um, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm on my way home. I drive home. 
Um, and I expected her to be furious with me, but that's not her, her style. She wouldn't get really furious with me. She was really just concerned and worried. And she's like, Ryan, this is, this is another level. And I really, there was nowhere I could hide at that point. I mean, all the, the denial and the rationalizations, where could I go? How could I pretend that this wasn't as bad as it was? Well, that was. was what I was going to ask is you grew up in a pretty stable home, as you said. There had to have been a part of your brain all along that was like, I'm lying. I'm keeping secrets. I'm passing out. I'm not able to function without this. How do you have a conscious awareness of how dysfunctional this is and still continue with it. I think we can all relate. I don't mean this in a judgy way, but what is that operating system? Well, you know, we talk about the the disease as being something separate from ourselves that at a certain point has a mind of its own. And you end up doing and saying things to yourself and to others uh, that are unlike things in any other context that you would think or say. Uh, because the insanity of addiction has just taken over and it, it really is finding the disease is trying to find any way to maintain the denial and rash, rationalization that keeps that addiction going. And so in my mind, as long as I could show up at family events and put on a face that I was doing OK and no one was worrying about me, um, then I was fine. If other people thought I was fine, then I was fine. And for the longest time, I was able to do that. When I knew that we had Thanksgiving coming up, I would take a few weeks off from drinking and I would sober myself up and I would, you know, do what I needed to do to look like I was relatively healthy. And then I had it down to a science. So then you go to Betty Ford Clinic in um, in California. There was a moment it, I just welled up with tears when they asked you, you'd been there a little while and they'd asked you, to read a passage out of um, uh, an important book. I, I think I don't know if it was a book that's important in AA. I, I forget those details. And your anxiety, you know, you talk throughout the book about your just, you know, how your anxiety could be just devastating to you. And so at that moment, it was like back when you were little and you felt that anxiety of, of public speaking and so forth. And I loved how you were like, mm, no, I'm not doing this. And the guys were like, Ryan, you got it. You can do it. And you did it. And that moment of just thinking how, you know, these were your family. I mean, you barely even knew these people. But what's so incredible to me is how in in so often in recovery, how people just we it's like they get it. We get it. Right. How how it's like all those pretenses are dropped. And it's like, you know, humanity is at its best. And I just I I, lo I was so glad you shared that. because It's like, ooh how disproportionate that moment was those people egging you on at a time you really needed it was just like oh you know heck yeah and then so you went through recovery or you went through betty ford and then you had to go through kind of a can you just talk about that sequence of you know you didn't like 28 day program or 30 day program and then we talk about the transition to you know just how you were able to stay sober yeah, you know, the first 30 days of recovery is like going to kindergarten, learn, learning how to live again, basically, you know, and and it was that for me. It was incredible when I looked back after 30 days to see how far I had come in such a short period of time. And I remember look, when I first got there, looking at the people that were graduating from the program after a month um, and thinking, how in God's name could these people have been where I'm at? just a month ago. And then I was there myself. And I was, what happened to me was that I, in that, in the process of that, I realized the power of service because these people that were ahead of me were able to offer some things to me that helped me get to where they were sitting. And then I was able to pay it forward to the people that were coming in behind me. So that was like the first education about what service can do for you. And just this initial spark of inspiration of what what purpose could be in my life at this point. Um, that had been the hardest thing for me with the loss of identity, with the loss of the career and all this stuff, trying to find something to replace that with that felt like purpose and meaning in my life was such a challenge. And I had no idea what that would be, but that was the first sort of inkling that I had. And so I was just like accepting what, whatever was offered to me as guidance, because I clearly, my way of doing things hadn't worked. And there was this, this thing that was larger than me that was being offered to me and was lifting me up and giving me all these little these little messages about 
meaning and purpose and service and 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 connectedness and spiritual a spiritual life that I just I, I wasn't I was trying not to overthink it for once in my life just show up and do what I was told and try to follow that feeling that little bit of inspiration and the best advice that people kept giving me was don't just go home to your life again and try to just pretend like everything nothing's changed this is a monumental change in your life and you need some kind of structure and program to maintain what you've begun because you've really just begun even though the change is drastic from where you were 30 days ago like you're still growing and changing at six months you're not going to be able to recognize the person you were when you were in your addiction in a year you won't recognize the person you are anymore and then in five years you're going to be doing things you couldn't have possibly imagined in your life. And I had a hard time imagining what that would be, what that looked like. I would just kind of chuckle. That sounds that sounds outlandish. But I, I just took their word for it. I took the advice. I did another month of um, living in a, like a sober house and, and doing day treatment at, at Betty Ford. When I finished that program, they recommended I go to an outpatient program back in L.A., um, so I <clears throat> checked myself into this place called the Matrix Institute on Addictions. I did like three or four months of uh, an intensive outpatient program there, um, which was more of a cognitive behavioral uh, therapy based place. Uh, it wasn't really a 12 step place. So it was nice to have kind of like different angles to this thing. And I was learning a lot about myself and I was learning a lot about psychology. It was also my first education about psychology and mental health. And the, the moment that was really pivotal was when I graduated that program about six months in, I was starting to work the steps with a sponsor, but trying to find ways to fill what was going to be a lot of time and structure that I was leaving my program as I left uh, this outpatient program. Um, and they came to me and said, you know, you're, you're, you're so involved here. You have such a, a way of relating to the other clients in a really positive way. You articulate the ideas of recovery to the newcomers so well. Would you, would you mind staying on as a volunteer and running some groups as a peer support, uh, and just you know doing your what you've been doing, but just stay on? And I, I was so honored by that offer, and I knew that it would be helpful for me in my recovery. That must have been so validating. Absolutely. And that was the other thing. Yeah. I mean, beyond giving me purpose, it was also just the restoration of my self-esteem. You know, one way to restore self-esteem is to do esteemable acts, to, to, to give of yourself in a helpful way. And, and also to, to just realize that I either had some talents that I had forgotten about that were, weren't related to being in Maroon 5, or that I had discovered new talents in the process of everything I had gone through. So it was empowering in both of those ways to recognize, oh, I have something to offer that isn't tied to that other identity, that there, there is the possibility of creating new identity in the works and projects that I invest myself in now. That's like the phoenix rising from the ashes is how it feels. Like so beautiful that, that the best of the human spirit choosing life, choosing renewal. Honestly, I'm going to just share this. Um, I checked my mom into Betty Ford when I was 21 or 22. And I mean, so, so much of what you talk about resonates with me. It's, oh, I can remember, you know, just remember sitting in, in those rooms going, you know, for the the family um, sessions and so forth. Uh, and there was a time when she was in her, when I was in my 20s and she'd gone through a lot and uh, I didn't think she was going to make it. And she said, you know, she did. And I asked her, you know, like what happened? Because she was in and out of recovery. And she finally said, she said, I just decided I wanted to live. And, you know, here she is 76, I think. Right. And it just takes so much courage and uh, some, some little magic and luck. Right. Because there are a lot of, I mean, I, you know, when I, I'm reading in your book, I mean, Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington and, you know, and, and people that have been lost. Right. Um, that it's like somehow they didn't have that choice. So when I think about people who have gone through what you've gone through, it really is just so remarkable. And I, it's a beacon of hope. I mean, I think about my mom with, with pride and gratitude. I think about you with pride and gratitude that like you guys, you guys chose life, right? I have a question from your perspective. Do you have kids or no? No. No, okay. So like if you're mentoring, say a younger person, how would you talk to them about 
using any substances, if it's marijuana or prescription or alcohol, like what do you, is there almost something you wish someone had told you when you were a young man? I've thought about that a lot. Um, if I did have kids, how I would have that conversation with them. Um, and I do, I work with teenagers as a therapist, uh, if at the clinic that I work at. So I do get, get to have these conversations. Um, I, I think for me, if, if it could have been a, a different conversation, I've always thought that I, I would have liked just a little bit more realism and honesty about it, because I think that grant, granted my parents, my dad in particular is, has always been kind of a, a goody goody. <laughs> uh, I don't think that he was lying or that it was a false reality the way that he talked about drugs and, and alcohol. I think in his mind, it was the devil, you know, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. was just something he wanted nothing to do with. He didn't understand why uh, anyone would do that. And he would always look at the teenagers that were smoking and he'd be like, why do they do that to themselves? Do they know how bad that is? And so for, for me, you know, I think I grew up with this image that all drugs were basically heroin, you know? Yeah. And that's how we were raised. Yeah, that's our generation. That's what we were taught. Yeah. And, and even alcohol, you know, we had basically, there was one family member, extended family member in our extended family that, that was an alcoholic. And I know that that was sort of the image I had in my head of what an alcoholic was. And my dad often referenced him and with a lot of disdain as being, you know, he's such a selfish guy. He's such a, um, you know, a, a, a angry guy. He's such a, and so I always thought that, you know, an alcoholic was all these things that it was essentially, if you had one of those problems, you were essentially a bad person. Yeah. Right. And so I, I, I stayed away from that throughout my youth for that reason. I was like, I don't want to be a bad person. I want to be a good boy. And, and I think it, there was a very, it, what it set me up for, even though it kept me out of trouble as a young person, I think it set me up for very black and white thinking, um, which is never really the, the healthiest way to, to deal with anything. Really. I've, I've seen that in a lot of different contexts as a, as a clinician, black and white thinking can be at the core of a lot of problems that we have in, in our relationship with ourselves and the way that we think about things. And, and of course the emotions and behaviors that, that are the outgrowth of that. So I think that when I eventually did finally realize, okay, I've been way in the black, you know, trying to keep myself in this place of being so good and so perfect that I probably overcompensated what I did eventually finally uh, try to go back the other direction. And, um, and then I had this whole rationalization in my mind. I was like, oh, I've been lied to my whole life. You know, this is yes. amazing. You know, everyone would, would love to be drunk all the time if they could. They just have jobs and things and they have to be parents. And so I don't have those things. And so I, I get to live the good life of being drunk all the time. And that's how I rationalized it in my mind at that point. So like the pendulum had swung completely. If I were talking to my kids about it, if I had them, I think I would probably say, you know, it's uh, it, there's a reason why people are attracted to these things. You know, there's both in terms of the positive aspects, it can be fun. Um, it can be a way of facilitating connection for people that are socially anxious and stuff. But there's a lot that comes with that choice. Um, it, it doesn't mean that it can't possibly be good, but it is a gamble, especially if you have that history in your family. And let me tell you what my experience was. I don't even really have that much history of it in my family. I wasn't somebody who was prone to an addictive personality or that kind of thing. And I still ended up having a problem with it. And, and it was something that really ended up causing a lot of problems for me. Um, even though at a certain point I did have a positive relationship with it and it did facilitate certain things in terms of the social aspects and stuff. So I would, I would, I think would just be really honest when it's age appropriate to be really honest about the reality of it. And it does seem like, like you were able to do everything right. And it really shows the degree to which the substance it's not just the human because you're right. We were raised being like, oh, those junkies, those drunks, those the stigmatizing the person. You started drinking after age 18, which we now know is supposed to help prevent addiction later in life. You you were raised in a stable home. You didn't really feel like an addict type of person and you still got into that situation. It really shows how powerful the actual substances when mixed with our brain chemistry can be. So Ryan, just I want to hear before we wrap up, um, I mean, it's amazing to me. You just talked a few minutes ago about how you were invited 
to be a volunteer and to help others in their recovery. And, and now you're a therapist. So how did you take the leap from volunteer to to being a, a, a therapist? So I was volunteering at the Matrix Institute for about two years. And during that time, it was the most meaningful thing in my life, uh, beyond just keeping me sober, which was the original reason to do it. Uh, it was the thing that I looked forward to most. And it were the moments in my week when that were the most uplifting and, and, and really connected me to uh, a life, again, that was worth living. Um, and in the course of doing that, I noticed that some of the, the people that worked there and other people that I've met in the process were people that had a similar story, that they'd gotten sober in midlife at some point, um, had found an inspiration in recovery that had led them to become a drug counselor or to go back to school and become some kind of uh, therapist. And so it's just kind of got me thinking. And then people started actually coming to me with that advice. Like, have you ever thought about doing this professionally? You seem to have a knack for it and um, you have the right temperament for it and and you seem to enjoy it already. So, uh, and I, I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it that much, but when people started saying that, I started thinking about it a lot uh, and started looking into it. I didn't know if I, I didn't even know what would be required. I had a bachelor's degree in English from UCLA um, so to get whatever credentials were necessary to be a, a, count, a drug counselor or whatever it was, uh, I didn't know what would be required or if I was capable of doing it. But I started looking into it. And before I knew it, I was applying to a couple programs for a master's degree in clinical psychology. I got into Pepperdine, which I didn't expect would happen. And I was like, well, that's, wow, uh, I, I can't miss this opportunity. And the thing that had changed also is I had spent like a decade after I left the band avoiding responsibility at all costs. And anytime any kind of opportunity came my way, I, I either couldn't even see it as an opportunity or I would avoid it because it was too scary. Investing myself in, in it was too scary. I would put it off or I would kind of avoid it. And now, because I was in a different place, when that opportunity presented itself to me, I just kind of ran with it and grabbed it. And a month later, I'm in class studying mindfulness and diagnosis and assessment and all this stuff. And I, that's just mind blowing to me because just, you know, a couple of years earlier, I was, you know, basically agoraphobic, having panic attacks every day. The thought of getting up in front of anyone, much less without a drink in my hand. <laughs> it's an incre I mean, it's such an incredible story. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is amazing. So do you see clients or do you have patients that come to you? Yeah. I'm a therapist now. My, my title currently uh, is associate marriage and family therapist. Uh, I should be a fully licensed marriage and family therapist by the end of this year, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> I work at a, at a clinic called the Missing Peace Center for Anxiety, uh, which is a wonderful uh, establishment here in, in uh, it's in Agora Hills, California, Southern California. Um, that's kind of my day job. I have private clients as well. Um, and, uh, that has been really rewarding. I'm building that my private practice, um, and just doing a lot of other things in, in the course of doing all of that, of course, getting my, my credentials to do this work and realizing how much it was changing my life in terms of that new purpose and meaning that I talk about. Uh, I realized I had a story to tell that might help some people, might offer some hope and inspiration. And that's when the book came about. And the book, Harder to Breathe, has been this whole other level of meaning and purpose because it was kind of ultimate therapy for me, closure on the past. But it also kind of was the facilitator of a whole new world of being an advocate, speaking on subjects that I've learned about, not just in my education to become a clinician, but in so much of my personal experience of having lived through this stuff. So just the, the blessings that come from recovery just keep uh, presenting themselves. And really all it is, is me being able to notice them now, being able to see when an opportunity presents itself, being able to embrace it as, as an opportunity and as a challenge, not as something terrifying to run away from. Speaking of being terrifying, do you, so do you, you said you're a speaker. So you do you do public speaking now? Yeah, which is an interesting thing for me. I hadn't anticipated that that would be where my life would go. And then I had a book coming out and, you know, I was going to do a, an appearance at a bookstore and a couple of things. That, and I was like, oh, I guess there's an opportunity to pursue that. Uh, 
And I was like, oh, I didn't really know that's what I was signing up for. And immediately the this flood of anxiety kind of washed over me because I realized, okay, I'm kind of returning to the scene of the crime. You're putting yourself in back in, be... yeah, sort of unwittingly. But how, do, how, I mean, do you have that same anxiety when you're speaking in front of a crowd of people now? I do. It's, it's different. Um, it's weird because I never really had stage fright as a drummer for the longest time. I always looked forward to performing, but there was a lot of adrenaline all day leading up to a performance, which was fine when we played once or twice a month, but that became a problem when I was we were doing it day in and day out until I was having a problem. And then after I had my sort of breakdown, then I developed a real phobia about that. And it became any kind of attention or focus on me, especially doing anything with my hands, you know, would cause my hands to shake. Uh, that kind of thing. And so there was a real connection of the trauma sort of that I had endured and this phobic anxiety that would come with that, anything associated with that. And so now there's like, there's a trigger that happens. I, I, I could feel that in me um, in anticipation. I do have that adrenaline rush and it does turn into that uh, kind of phobic response that it, it, it's a, a physiological response that didn't happen uh, for the longest time as a drummer. Um, but what I'm able to temper that with is the knowledge that I've done it before, I've gotten through it, and that that, that feeling is is not just like a a, um, a siren, an alarm for something that is terrible that's going to happen that I need to run away from. It's more an alarm of an opportunity to grow, another opportunity to walk into something that makes me uncomfortable and recognize that if I do it, and the more that I do it, the more it becomes something that becomes a a, a a pathway to a different way of being. I can't change that trigger unless I approach that trigger, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, no, it's like you're giving yourself the chance to to overcome it. Let me ask you, do you ever worry about relapse? Relapse in terms of drinking? Um. Honestly, for the longest time, that wasn't and hasn't been on the forefront of my mind because I I pretty effectively changed my relationship with alcohol completely. And I credit that to the fact that I did do a pretty holistic approach to recovery and incorporated a lot of different modalities, not just the 12 steps, not just going to rehab for 30 days and then thinking that I was cured. Uh, but the CBT method it was really helpful in that. And CBT, um, just I, I, really, I should have asked you before, cogn cognitive behavior yeah. therapy, right? Yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy in the context of addiction, basically, it's identifying triggers, things that would lead to drinking, identifying the thoughts that lead to craving, which leads to use, and changing the thought, either avoiding triggers or changing the thought before it becomes a craving or use. Um, and... I, I realized that I had this really unhelpful association with alcohol, that it was still the party. It was still the thing that made me the most charming version of myself. And that after a couple of drinks, my worries went away and I became more fun and more outgoing. I realized that was an outdated story that I was telling myself. It wasn't true anymore. And so and when I had those thoughts, I realized I have to change those thoughts. Otherwise, that's going to lead to a craving. And so I started really utilizing that CBT approach of changing those thoughts. And the other method that was really helpful is playing the tape forward. It's like when you have a, a, a trigger that makes you think about drinking and I have a thought that might lead to craving that drink, instead of you know, thinking about what that's going to feel like and what tonight's going to be like when I have fun drinking, playing the tape forward to the inevitable hangover or a week from now after a bender when I'm really struggling the, you know, the kind of spiritual bottom that I went to, I had to take myself to that place, even as painful as it was. It's like, that's the only thing that's really going to change my, uh, you know, the association that I have with alcohol to one that is more realistic, which is that it may have been fun at one point. It may have been a positive relationship, but it became an entirely toxic one. At this point in my life, drinking is like drinking poison it's really not going to serve me anyway. And it, sooner or later, it's just going to end up back in that place. Will you occasionally have a, a glass of wine or a beer or is it totally abstinence for you? No, honestly, when I look at or smell alcohol, much less, uh, it's just gross to me. It really isn't something that appeals to me. 
every now and then, the more distance that I've gotten, um, you know, every now and then one of those things will creep in. You see a commercial, you see a movie, you know, in particular, I think a movie or something where, where it's like, it's a very romantic setting and you see people, it's like, they're just having a, a glass of wine on a romantic date, or they're just doing something that would have been lovely for me 20 years ago. Um, and there's that, that moment where there's like, oh yeah, that looks nice. But that's when the, the, the sort of training kicks in when I'm able to go, okay, yeah. And it was, it's probably nice for them. And it was nice for me at one point, but it wouldn't be nice for me now. <laughs> okay. I've got a couple last quick burning questions. Do you, I mean, looking at your setup behind you, it looks like, and you know, a lot of people are listening to this, so they don't get to see the super cool background that you have in your, in the studio you've built. It looks like you still play the drums, right? You've brought drums back into your life. To a certain extent. I have, I, you know, in the, in the spirit of vulnerability, I've tried to be, you know, as honest and real about everything when I talk about my story and, um, of all the things that I've overcome and I've worked on and I've been able to find a new relationship with, uh, music in general, but drums in particular is still probably the most complicated relationship that I have just cause it's so fraught with that history, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. trauma of it, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the thing that was you know, the most wonderful and inspiring in my life, but also the most painful. So, you know, I've had good days and good weeks and good months and years. There's a metaphor in that, the most wonderful Absolutely. thing and the thing that taught you the, the most. So there's also something uniquely painful about something being interrupted before you felt you were really done with it. I had that where I had to leave school the first time I tried because I got sick. And I never again lived in a dorm. And when I went back, I was an adult and I didn't like make college friends or do any of those things. And I still sometimes have dreams that I'm living in a dorm and I'm 46. So it seems so silly. And when I brought my son to college, I was like, oh my gosh, but it it's not that I want to be back there. It's that it was interrupted for me. And so that probably is a similar thing. You 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 lost it. You didn't walk away from it. It is. And it's weird. And I have those moments where I'm like, oh, it should be so easy. You know, I should, I, I remember what it felt like when I was 16 years old and it was just fun. It was just freedom. It was just expression. And why can't I just today decide that's what it's going to be and just sit down at the drums and have that kind of freedom and fun. And then it maybe every now and then it starts to feel that way and then something twists and then it becomes complicated again. And it's just something I have to work through it. It's, it's a life form Thing, but I still have those dreams too. I mean, I, I have those, that's my recurring dream. It hasn't been in a, in a little while, but, but every now and then it, it, I have one of those dreams where I'm like in the back of a van with the guys and we're like on our way to a gig and it's now though. And I'm like thinking to myself, wait a second, we're about to go on stage. Like, can I play? What are we going to play? Are we going to play the songs from back then? Do I have to play the songs? they play now like <laughs> and it's like that that you know that nightmare you have about getting in front of the class and you haven't learned the, the lesson prepared. or you haven't studied mm -hmm. for the test so okay so let's we can round out our dis our long discussion and thank you so much for so much of your time i mean wow what a what a story and what what props to you for what you've gone through and and what you have done with your life and how you're like you say with service and giving back to people and and it really meant a lot to me like I said I, I come from a, a family with a lot of addiction alcoholism in particular so the, your story was particularly meaningful to me um what's your relationship like now with the band are you and Adam still friends I mean do you see them at all yeah um I, you know I wish that we were closer than we are obviously I, I still miss that that thing that I'm very grateful, I have a lot of gratitude at this point in my life for having been a part of it. I look back on those years of my life with just a lot of gratitude and, to, you know, not just for having created this thing that was a big thing, but just for the experience of that connection. I wish that I still had that. Obviously, our lives have gone a different direction, so it's not realistic that we're involved with each other on that level. Um, however, we check in with each other and I, you know, for instance, when they're in town, I'll go to the show, whatever. I, we obviously see each other at events like, you know, friends and family when they have weddings and anniversaries and birthdays and things. Um, Adam and I, every now and then we'll check in just with text, text, late night text messages. And it's usually just silly, goofy stuff we would have said to each other when we were teenagers. 
Um, and then every now and then we'll have a, li- a lengthy conversation about life and reminisce or just, um, you know, share things that are that are different. Every now and then we actually act like grownups and he'll tell me about his kids and his family and I'll tell him about what I've been working on in my career and, the, and how meaningful that is. And I know that he's he's proud of me and happy for me. He very graciously wrote the um, the foreword to my book, Harder to Breathe, which um, which was very kind. And um, and, you know, I, I try to stay involved in the things they're doing. Uh, as much as I can, but yeah, I, I wish that it were there were ways for us to be more involved in each other's lives. But it is what it is. Yeah. Is there anything that we should? Oh, last question. What did I not ask? I feel like I've asked about every question under the sun. Is there anything that you're like? Hey, you get an A minus minus now because you forgot to ask this important thing. <laughs> uh, no, we covered a lot of bases. Obviously, I talked about, uh, told the whole story. Talked about my. Well, I am. I'm developing a podcast. That's a new thing. We didn't talk about that, but it's oh, not yeah. out yet. So I don't know. If that's oh, fun. okay. What's it? What's it going to be called? It's going to be the Harder to Breathe podcast. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Oh, I have a last question. Um, did you and Sean ever get married? No, we've had a pretty uh, unconventional uh, history and relationship, and but we're we live together still, and um, it's uh, yeah, you know, I, it's funny because we've had such a non-conventional roundabout way of ending up together and neither of us are particularly traditional people um she came from a whole other interesting family background um and i don't know i we're, we were kind of 90s kids she's kind of a feminist she didn't even imagine she thought she was going to be a career woman um and then she got involved with me. <laughs> she was not really, not really that interested in, in being a mom and that whole thing. Um, so, but we're, yeah, we're together. We just never really decided to, to prioritize. That wasn't, the, uh, that wasn't the important thing. Well, I, I mean, honestly, she yeah. seems amazing. It was cool to get to know her through your book. She really sounds like a, a very kick-ass woman. So I hope she, you get her on the podcast and uh, we get to hear from her too. Congratulations for having achieved so much, having helped create one of the greatest bands in history, and to have overcome um, so much um, darkness, I guess. And it's just, it's cool. I mean, you're still, you're a young guy. Like, you know, when I think about what you've achieved and, and kind of how you've answered the call now, it is really cool. And even with the, you know, I've got your book right here on my, my Kindle um, your survivors know just when you talk about how you're sharing your story really in service to other people and whether it's, you know, daughters of alcoholics or, you know, addicts themselves or friends of addicts. I mean, I've had some, I've had to stage interventions. That's scary stuff, right? You know, it's like none of that is fun. And, and yet I really, I'm so grateful and really admire your courage, um, to, to be so brave in telling your story and most importantly to be doing the work so that you can now help so many other people. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It was great to meet you. A great conversation. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Wow. What a wonderful man. And what a, just a intense story. It's really, it's, it's really amazing and heartening to know that you can come back from, Um, so much darkness and heartache. Yeah, he's amazing. I I love, you can tell he's done the work. Mm -hmm. And even when he's showing that vulnerable side of himself, it's, it's so fascinating to see what it's like to come out the other end, you know, to have gone through all of it, done the work, and then be able to talk about it so honestly. Yeah, it's such a beautiful and gripping book. And from, you know, again, of course, it's like, you know, it reminds me of, do you guys remember that book, Where the Red Fern Grows? Like little Dan and, you know, Doggy Ann or whatever her name is. And you know, it's like, I read it when I was little and then I read it to my kids and you just want a different outcome. You're like, please let there be a different outcome. But you know, it's not going to be a different outcome. And it reminded me of that because like he said, he opened with that scene where they had that almost like intervention saying, hey, it's just not working because you can't it's like he he couldn't couldn't drum properly and it's like well if you can't drum properly it's tough to keep your that important role in the band and then to know that it just got so much darker 
and darker and and worse and what he went through and then how he he chose chose life and chose love and came back it's it's impressive it's heartening you know i mean and, and so many others that was actually the one thing i didn't get to ask him about is um the uh foo fighters um what's taylor taylor yeah. yeah and just thinking about and it was similar you know when i i just was reminding myself what happened with him and it was you know uh, benzos and alcohol and just like this um cocktail of drugs that were you know found when um you know he passed away so you just it's like Every now and then, when it comes to addiction and those who make it, you just go, "Ooh, there is some grace." And and like he and I loved how he really emphasized the gratitude he has. Right? I mean, it just it's like, gosh, talk about a way to heal yourself. You know, gratitude goes a long way. So, you know, it's an interesting thing because his story is so remarkable because he was part of this band that we've heard of a million times. But there are so many people who need to hear this story who are hanging on to how something should have been. Like, I should have gotten that promotion. I should have married that girl. I should have had whatever this dream was come true. And they lose that. And then they go into that dark place. When you have that happen to someone like that with a story that is so exceptional, then we get to hear it on on a bigger scale. But it relates to so many of us who have had something important interrupted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love that question that you asked. And I, I think there are a lot of people, maybe they don't, maybe they're not addicts, but to your point, where something slipped through their hands for whatever reason, and they forever yeah. feel the sting of that thing that they felt like they were entitled to. And which is what's cool about him is he really feels like, you know, and he talks a lot about the serenity prayer, um, you know, in, in AA, God, give me the... Um, wisdom to accept um you know what i can't change what i can and, change yeah and then yeah. and 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 the courage to change what i can and the you know uh, wisdom to know the difference and it just it does feel like there's this incredible graciousness with his and he does talk about acceptance a lot in the book this idea of just accepting and even to hear him talk about it, you know in these last couple of years those feelings of of belonging and purpose are rivaling what he felt like to be in his 20s in one of the world's biggest bands, right? And so it's just, it's neat to see, okay, that thing that that you lost is being replaced with something else that's really beautiful and compelling. You know, it just gave me so much hope because it was like, oh, what my heart ached for him to have lost so much. And it's like, oh, well, you've lost something, but you've regained something else. And it feels like in his case, something else that is even um, more meaningful you know at this stage well, and life. he kept the girl you know oh he totally he kept the girl that there's so many people who have all the success but they lose the girl mm-hmm. and um i don't know if you watched um daisy jones and the six but that was an amazing fictionalized rock and roll story but yeah. you know about when it comes down to it if you can keep keep the love of your life that's that's worth so much more, you know? So you look back and it's like, what if he'd become famous and he'd lost the girl? I mean, Mm -hmm. who knows what we would have regretted, you know? Yeah, no, it's cool. I mean, and even though the the, the other band members, um, if you will, caused his departure that he doesn't seem to have recriminations, he gets it, he takes responsibility. There is just so much graciousness in those hard conversations and that, those difficult circumstances. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's a kind of a master class in, um, how, how to deal with, um, with, uh, integrity, um, and care in, in these really difficult experiences. Right. So, yeah. And if he'd held on to a lot of resentment and blame for them, it's really hard to recover and go through recovery with mm-hmm. resentment like that. You know I mean? Yeah. Yeah. A, I think it's helpful that that there was this biological fact of what was happening with his body, but also just to be able to be like, they didn't really cause it. They wanted him to stay, and that must yeah. be such a comfort. But yeah, if he if you try to hang on to that, it, it just gets you nowhere. Yeah. 
All right. Well, let's wrap up. This has been another amazing episode of Open Relationships Transforming Together. We would love, 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 love for you to subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcast, YouTube, Spotify, iHeart, Audible, you name it. We are all those amazing places. We love your feedback or advice. Uh, you can email us at openrelationships at your tango Dot com. We love your comments wherever uh, you get your podcast, wherever you want to chime into the conversation, suggest guests, give us uh, your thoughts. We are working so hard for you and to bring you a show that makes a powerful, positive impact in your life. And whether it's dealing with addiction or learning to how to have hard conversations with courage to... Um, learning to forgive, right? All of these things are so important in our lives. And so many of us weren't taught them. And we just, we were here to try to help you in these really core areas. So thanks for listening and watching and we'll see you next time.